Welcome to Trinity to Go, a ministry of Trinity Lutheran Church in downtown Bismarck. I'm Pastor Martha Harrison, and I'm just so glad that you've taken some time today to join me for a bit of worship. Our introduction to the day for this Sunday, the 14th Sunday after Pentecost, goes like this. In today's gospel, many people take offense at Jesus' invitation to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Even many of Jesus' disciples peel off. This is the backdrop in John's gospel for Peter's confession of faith. To whom can we go? As Peter, in words we sometimes sing just before the gospel is read. You have the words of eternal life. In order to take such a stand as Peter and Joshua did, Paul tells us to arm ourselves with the word of God. We pray in the spirit that we might be bold ambassadors of the gospel. So we, we gather this day in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Holy God, your word feeds your people with life that is eternal. Direct our choices and preserve us in your truth that renouncing what is false and evil, we may live in you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. <clears throat> our reading for today comes from John chapter 6. The hard saying that offends Jesus' disciple and his disciples in his claim that his followers must eat his flesh and drink his blood. <clears throat> The followers who return to their old lives know something about how odd this sounds. Simon Peter, on the other hand, knows something about the scarcity of living, gracious words. He asks the most important question, to whom shall we go? So our reading today is from John chapter 6, beginning with verse 56. <clears throat> Jesus said, Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe, and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. <clears throat> because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Here ends our reading. So grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So for the past few weeks, our gospel reading has been from John 6. And we've heard an awful lot about Jesus being the bread of life, right? Well, we continue in that chapter of John today. And you are not going to believe what I noticed this week. Can you believe that when Jesus finished teaching in the, in the temple in Capernaum, when he finished telling his followers that he was the bread of life, and that whoever eats of this bread will live forever, some of his followers basically looked at each other and probably said that it was too hard, that it made no sense, and they left. They went home. These are people that believed in Jesus, who had followed him, who had given up so much to do so. But now, finally, after all their waiting and watching and wondering and worrying, they've grown tired. 
and they can no longer see clearly that it was about Jesus, what it was about Jesus that attracted them to him in the first place. And so they leave. Many leave, and the 12 remain. Can you believe it? Well, I can. Are we really all that different from those people who left that day? I mean, who here hasn't at one time or another struggled with doubts? Who hasn't been in a situation where you wondered where God was or if God was there with you? Maybe it happened while you were sitting at the bedside of a loved one as they struggled with some illness. Maybe it was in the early part of the morning and you woke up alone and wondered why you were so lonely. Maybe it was in the dark of the night as you struggled with depression and you wondered if it was worth it or not. Or maybe you just were doing the, jerk, the dishes and you wondered why things in your life hadn't turned out as you expected. There are many times in our lives when we struggle to see God. There are times when we are confused and we doubt when having faith seems so hard. We really are no different from those who deserted Jesus that day. They didn't understand. They were confused, trusting that what Jesus was saying was true, but was just too hard for them in that moment. I think what we've all been there a time or two in our lives. Maybe we haven't given up and left, but maybe we've not gone to church as much anymore. Maybe we haven't prayed as much. Maybe we've had questions. Maybe we've had frustrations. Maybe we found it hard to understand where God was and where God, what God was up to. And that's okay. Faith is hard. When we are honest with ourselves, we can see that believing can be hard. John paints a picture for us in this chapter of what disbelief looks like. A portrait where Jesus is surrounded by people who wanted to believe, who used to believe, who have been trying to believe, but who have gone through the motions too long, and they gave up. But he also... John also paints a picture of us of what belief, of courage, and faith looks like. Many of these, the people who were following Jesus abandoned him to this point. Who again was left? The twelve disciples stayed. So Jesus asked them, do you wish to go away? And Simon Peter, as he often does, is the one to answer and he says, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. What makes these 12 men different from the others who are following Jesus? What makes them different from the ones who left? Did they have stronger faith? Did they fully understand what was going on so they had no doubts or questions or anything? Now, at this point, it would be so easy to say that those who were following Jesus and abandoned him were unbelievers, that they had weak faith. And it would be easy to imagine that the 12 disciples were these flawless giants of faith, that they understood everything. Yet we see in all of the Gospels time and time again that these 12 men had questions, had doubts, messed up. There were times when they didn't understand and times when they were afraid. There were times when they were prideful and times when they made the bad decisions. So what sets them apart from the other believers who left Jesus that day? One thing. Remember what Peter said? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter knew where to look. That's it. They didn't have all the answers. They didn't make the best decisions. They didn't have the strongest faith and live a life free of doubt. Peter and the other 11 simply knew where to look. They knew to look to Jesus that he was what they needed, whether they understood it or not. What about us? Do we know where to look? So there are many times as a pastor that I get asked this question. Do you have to go to church to believe in God? 
course the answer to that question is no. You don't have to go to church to believe in God, but I will argue that we need to go to church to gather as a faith community, to hear the word, to receive the sacraments, to be offered the chance to be encountered by Jesus and his living word. Through the hearing of the word and the receiving of the sacraments through baptism and communion, Jesus' real presence is made known to us. We are directed to that one place amid all the craziness of our world and our life that we can look to and know for sure we will find God in Christ there for us. When I share this exp explanation with others, those who want me to say, no, you don't have to go to church, might respond with something like, well, Pastor Martha, God is everywhere, right? Of course, God is at work in many places in our world. God works through those who believe in Him, in their jobs, in their families. God is at work in creation each day. Yes, God is at work in so many different places, yet it is here when we gather to worship, when we hear the word, when we receive the sacraments, we feast on the bread of life, that we are reminded again and again that we are beloved children of God, that we have a purpose, that because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we've been set free. We've been given this gift of forgiveness and life and salvation. We are reminded that Jesus is where we need to direct our attention, that even when we do not understand, even when we have questions and doubts, even when we wonder if we believe or not, we can turn to Jesus, knowing that Christ, God in Christ is at work for us, offering us the promise of forgiveness, acceptance, meaning, and life. When I was in my last two years of high school and the early part of college, I had decided that I didn't need this God stuff anymore. A close family friend had died and it shook me and I was done with God. I didn't understand. I certainly didn't need church. It was during this time, especially in college, that I started making some questionable decisions. I was living away from home for the first time. I was lonely. And I felt kind of empty. I was certain that I didn't believe in God anymore, but there was a friend who lived on the same floor of my dorm who was a faithful Christian and went to church weekly and went to chapel during the week. You see, we went to a Lutheran college. She would often invite me to go with her, and I'd nicely tell her no. Until one particular Sunday when I was feeling especially down, and I thought if nothing else, I could spend time with my friend, even if I really didn't see that I had a need for church. So I went to church with her. It felt like home. It was familiar. I listened to the sermon, I took communion, and I would love to say it was like a switch that went off in my brain, that I never had any doubts or questions since then, but I can't. But I can tell you this was a beginning. I began to see or maybe remember that I needed God. I slowly began attending church and chapel. I eventually started helping out with campus ministry functions. The questions, the doubts, they never went away fully, but I knew where, where to look, right? I recognized the love that God had for me. Martin Luther once said, although God is present in all creatures, and I might find God in stone and fire and water, or even in a rope, for God is certainly there. Yet God does not wish that I seek him there apart from the word and thereby cast myself into fire or the water or on the rope. God is present everywhere, but does not wish that you grope for him everywhere. Grope rather where the word is. There you will lay a hold of God in the right way. Grope where the word is. It's a vivid way to think about the importance of gathering together as the people of God around the word of God. It gives us this image of people desperately seeking the word. It's when we gather together, when we hear the word and receive the sacraments. We receive the promise that Jesus is the bread of life. That Jesus offers his body and blood. His own life for ours that Jesus has and offers us, as Peter so boldly declares, the words of eternal life. So continue to gather.
continue to receive Jesus, continue to support one another along this journey of faith. Continue to invite others to gather with us. Don't let your questions, your doubts, and more become stumbling blocks. Just continue to remember where you can receive the words of eternal life, Jesus Christ, so that you will be strengthened and renewed to believe and have life in his name. Amen. <clears throat> Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day. And Lord, we, we thank you for being the place to which we look for eternal life. Guide us to seek your word, to seek your sacraments. Guide us, O oh Lord, to seek you when we have doubts and questions. Be with those in our life, O oh God, who are struggling in any way, in mind, body, or spirit. Bring your healing presence to them, O oh God. Let your presence be known to them. Be with their caregivers who sometimes feel helpless and who are oftentimes exhausted. Bring them the assurance that you are part of the process. Bring them rest. We thank you, O oh God, for all the people of faith that brought us to your word, that brought us to your sacraments, those people that have gone before us, may their lives of faith be a witness to us. Be with those who have lost the, who, ha, who are suffering a loss of a loved one. Comfort them, O oh God, in the promise of eternal life with you. We place these prayers at your feet, O oh God, confident that you hear them and you answer them. We pray them in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thanks so much for being here today. I just have a, a couple announcements. First off, as we're thinking about this idea of gathering for worship, obviously virtually is a great way if you're not able to come in and be with us in person. You know, we have this Trinity to go. We also have online services. But there is a piece of that that is missing, right? So uh, if you are a person that is unable to come in person and would like to receive communion, please let Pastor Mark or myself know. You can call into the office and Clarissa will direct you to one of us and we more than happily will bring you communion. Also, there are lots of, uh, we're coming up on the beginning of the school year, so if you're watching this and you have kids, uh, know that you know we need to get church school registrations in, confirmation registered, all of that information is out on our website. We have some great uh, service projects coming up, so you can check that out on our e-news as well as the website as well. Our Facebook page and our website, trinitybismarck.com, are just great places to find lots of information. Thank you for your ongoing support. There are ways there as well to give online or you're able to uh, send something into the, the address that will pop up on your screen here in just a few minutes. But now as we conclude, receive the blessing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Again, thanks for being with us, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>